Hey, thanks for joining us online. Here at Flatirons, we seek to bring the awesome life of Christ to a lost and broken world. If you want to connect with us on social media, the links are below. Now let's jump into our series, Can People Really Change? Yeah. How we doing? Good? Good. So I had surgery on my shoulder uh, on Halloween, and last weekend I said, hey, Doc, can I take my sling off? He goes, nope. So I just didn't ask this week. And so uh, and I, I came in the back door a few minutes, 12 seconds, and someone hit me in the arm. Yes, and, and God saw you, and he knows your name. And so... Uh, Hey, the video you just saw, um, last week we talked about how we are, we are absolutely convinced that God uh, wants to take this awesome message that he's, that he's given flat on us, that God doesn't hate anybody. He loves us. And no matter what you've done or where you come from or, or, or what other people have said about you, he loves you and everybody gets a second chance. This awesome life of Christ. We want to take that message you know, uh, beyond, uh, beyond Denver, beyond the front range, beyond, beyond America. And those are six of our international partners uh, that we are partnering with across uh, Mexico uh, and a couple of countries in Africa, we're in Kabul, Afghanistan, and, uh, and then we're in college campuses across Europe. Uh, la- this past week, we brought all of our international partners together for a retreat. It's the first time we've ever done that. And we thought, what, what can we do that would just really just say, this is who Flatirons I- is. And so we took all of our partners to Black Hawk. And, uh, and it, was, it was great. And the offering this week, du- we doubled down. It's awesome. And so... Uh, uh, well, we, they went to the mountains for a retreat and they, they came back together. If, 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 if watching that video, again, just stirs anything in your heart going, I want to find out more about how God could use me somewhere other than here. I mean, it always starts at home, right? But then you, you saw something, a, a kid in, uh, going to school in Afghanistan or, or you saw some kids in Africa or you saw some, some people in Mexico. If you want to find out more about that, then just go to any of our information centers or, or get online on our website and go, and go, to, go to our missions page because here's what happens. Anytime you, you get, get away from like the every day, you just hear God better. I mean, every time I go on a mission trip and I come back, you, like when you find out, oh, Jim's been to Africa, buckle up, here we go, because God does some, some different things in my, in, my, in my life. And so if you're interested in maybe going on a short-term trip or, or maybe even an internship or even going on staff or something like that in the world, and, and again, your heart just started beating different. Uh, pay attention to that is all, all I'm saying and then, and then check out and see where that, that, that goes. So uh, about four years ago, I went on one of these trips and, and so uh, Paul Bruner, our executive pastor and a couple of other guys, we decided we're gonna visit all of our international partners in one trip and so in 12 days, uh, we flew from here to, uh, to Afghanistan. You have to go through Dubai to Afghanistan. We spent a couple of days there. Then we flew down to Nairobi and we talked to our partners there in Uganda and South Sudan and then we got on an airplane and we went to Mexico City. We did that all in 12 days and then when I got home, I had diarrhea for a month. It was crazy. <laughs> And, uh, 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 but the tacos were great. But, um, but uh, here's what happens is, is you, whenever you go and you, you think, I'm going to go and do something, I'm going to go help something, God has a different agenda and he has something planned. And there are moments in your life when you look back and go, there was a day in history that my life intersected another person's life and it was different from that point on. And that happened on that trip four years ago. I was in Mexico City. We were visiting uh, Mosaico, which is what we, uh, our, our work we do in inner city, uh, Mexico City. And, and John Luke, who leads that ministry, he has, he's given us a tour of the projects. And we went to one of these projects. And uh, we went to some people's house, uh, James and Aaron Henderson's house. And while we were there, James and I started talking. And it's like... It's like that day that you discover you have a long lost brother, all right? And we just, our hearts connected about what God was doing in the hearts of men at Flatirons, what God was doing in the hearts of men in Mexico City, and then this, this whole spiritual formation thing of change in our lives. And so we started talking and he said, hey, Jim, I have a book I want you to read. I'm like, I, I don't do that. That's Scott. I don't read books. And, uh, but it only had like 16 pages. And so I did it. And so, uh, uh, and then we started, uh, we started a friendship. I, I would say this, James, come on up here. Um, uh, t- today, I, 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 Ben and I are really stingy. We don't like to share this stage with anybody. And so uh, we, that's probably a sin. We probably need to pray through that. But we're, we're okay. But, but if we're going to share the stage with somebody, it's going to be somebody we go, we trust. Over the last three, three years, the person who's had the most spiritual influence over my life is James Henderson. The person that I would point to and go, who's my teacher? Who's my pastor? It's James Henderson. And uh, so much, so, he's the one that got me to go to Crucible. He's the one that you know, told me to pay attention to what God's already doing in my life. He's the one who sees things in me that I never thought. If, if you've heard anything good come out of my mouth for the last three years, 
It's a dumbed down version of something he taught me. It's just all I got, you know. And so, uh, so uh, again, this is one of the, the dearest friends I've ever had. And so, so when he came up for our, for our global summit, our, our retreat we've had last week, and I knew that I was having all this surgery stuff done, um, I said, James, will you come and teach what you've been teaching me? We're in this series called Can People Really Change? We're talking about all the aspects of our life. But here's what James has taught me. It's actually possible to change from just being religious to actually believing that God wants to be my friend. And when you believe that God actually wants to be your friend, that's, that's life-changing. And so, so we were down there talking. Uh, it's so funny. When we first met, we found out we were both born in West Texas. Uh, his dad knows the doctor that delivered me. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, we both were looking at each other going, how do we get here? We are so out of our league and out of, right? and out of our lane. And so, so he was like, well, I can't do this. And he's like, just picture as your backyard. Just a lot of people came to your backyard. Yes. That's all it is. Big and backyard. Big backyard. And so uh, he's, a, he's a missionary in Mexico City. And so he'll probably just break into Spanish. And I'm lost, but it's interesting. Anyway, and uh, last hour he said, just, I'm just going to pretend like I'm talking to a bunch of Mexicans. Yes. And a bunch of people went, on delay. It was just great. You know, and so, so <laughs> it, it's like. It works. It, it works. works. Anyway. I love Mexicans. Yeah, I know. I, I love them. Yeah. So I'm going to pray for him. And then I want you all to give him uh, a, a flat irons. Mexican uh, welcome as only we can do. Let me pray and then welcome my friend James. God, so will you just take all the way the nerves and all the, all the fear and all the anxiety and just shine through James. I, I hear your voice better um, when, I, when I listen to James and I give you all the credit, God, but, but you put your hand on different people and you say, I'm gonna use you to speak truth in a new way and people are gonna lean into it like they used to lean into it when, when your son Jesus spoke. So will you teach us about Jesus through James? It's in, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you welcome James? Flatirons, I love you. I, I do. The, the second that I began to meet people from Flatirons, something came into my life that just fills me with joy at every single turn. Um, uh, the, on, the, on the video up there, you saw a, a, a sign in Spanish that it says, El amor de Jesús sana todo. Uh, you know what that says? <laughs> it says, uh, the love of Jesus heals everything. And I believe that with the deepest conviction and belief of my heart, that God wants to get up really close to us and heal anything at all that's broken and give us a life of joy and friendship like we could have never imagined before. And, and part of that, don't, don't you love the joy? Jesus says, my joy I leave with you. Uh, make, I want my joy to be complete in you. What I love about flat irons is it's actually a very joyful experience knowing Christ. We, you break all the rules of church. I love, I love you. Uh, church is fun again. And I, I said something to a friend the other night at, at, her, at her house and I, she said, what are you gonna talk about? I said, spiritual formation. She goes, oh, that sounds boring. And I'm like, oh no. But when we're talking about spiritual formation, we are talking about one thing in particular. Anything that I do intentionally to become in character more like Christ. And I wanna talk about a very specific aspect of Jesus' character today. He is a very, very good friend. The best the world has ever seen and, and, and the greatest friend that could possibly walk into our life. And I know He's, he's, he's over and over again walking into yours. So that's, that's, that's where we're at today. I've loved this series, absolutely loved the series. Um, we're wired for fun and every time, Aaron and I couldn't wait for each message in this series to be posted online so we could be in our back, backyard in Mexico City and watch it as soon as we could and take notes and just keep up with, with what's happened in the series. Um, just to catch you up really, really fast, Jim and Ben have been talking to us about how when God comes in to change us, he is, it is not window dressing or a small tweak here and there. Jesus comes to, to build change from the inside out. And that, when, and, and that change from the inside is en route to changing our entire life. And so when Jim goes, Jesus can change your life, he means business, it's from inside. Or that Jesus can change um, my body, that Jesus can change our families that are so 
beautiful and wonderful and hopeful and at the same time sometimes very dysfunctional jesus can change those too we are we're in good hands with him ben talked about how how god works change by the renewing of our mind all right um that that that, that there's this the the life of our mind is is the point of departure for change in our life it's the starting point and he's renewing the way we think and rethink our lives and our strategy for living. And that that thinking begins to set down deep into our bones. And Jim talked to us about God can change our bodies too. And our bodies can be these instruments of good in this world. Uh, like like the, the other night we were listening to our, our, our global partners. And I, I am just in awe of the good and the truth and the beauty that comes out of flat irons and connects with people across the world and changes people's lives from a very deep place. And not just one part of their life, every single part of their life. Um, I leaned over to my son Caleb when I was listening to the stories of the global partners as they shared, um, sometimes with just tears and it's, it's ah. I said, Caleb, I said, you realize how much good these people do in the world. And so I just want to throw back on you. Do you realize the good that you are doing in the world? And it's very, very important. And so from my heart, if I don't say it, I'll burst. I, I, I just want to say on behalf of the partners around the world, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. What you do... I hope you know that whatever act of generosity you do with your life, whatever kindness and goodness you show to someone else God loves, that's everybody, you are bringing relief to the heart of God himself. Because he suffers with people and he wants to heal them all. Um, yeah, so that healing starts with us, right? I mean, uh, exhibit A. Uh, Jim and Ben talked about how there's a, there's a reliable model for change, okay? Like you can really trust this stuff. We get it from Jesus and Jesus knows what he's talking about. When he looks at the mess that the world is in, uh, what God does is he says, okay, I need to send my son to show them what I'm talking about. And Jesus does that so well. And so God starts with forgiveness with us. He starts with grace that looks like, feels like forgiveness because he knows we carry a lot of baggage with us and he wants to heal, the, heal us and, 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 and we start with forgiveness. Um, the guilt, the shame, the fear, the insecurity, the brokenness. He begins to heal that by saying, I forgive you. Do you know that scripture teaches that he doesn't remember the wrongs that you do? Completely forgiven. I can do that. I remember the harm done to me. And even more, I remember the harm that I've done to the people I love the most. So I can feel guilty about it. And God says, let's start right there with forgiveness, James. Okay. He forgives you. But that's not the only grace he gives us. C.S. Lewis calls it mere forgiveness of sins. No, 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 no. There's a whole lot more. There's grace that sustains us. It nurtures us. It feeds us. It gives us energy. It gives us energy and power to begin to believe that God is so much inside me and giving me confidence and strength and joy and knowing his love, that I begin to believe that what he says about us is true. Uh, maybe we start to think our lives are really worth it. And your life is a whole lot more than you give it credit for. Oh, the... 
day I turned 40, uh, I, I, I didn't know what to think about it, okay? And I had a friend come up to me and he said, uh, how you feeling about turning 40? I was like, you know, I don't, I, I'm not sure what to think about it. Uh, feeling pretty good. But uh, I always had seen 40 as being kind of older, you know? And he goes, I wouldn't worry about it, James. As a matter of fact, I'd ignore it. It's the best advice I've ever been given, probably. He said, I'd ignore it because you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. That's what you are. And 40 is nothing. And 60 is nothing. And 80 is nothing. I could live to be 100 in this adventure God gives us in the world he loves so much. But it is just the start. And he starts with forgiveness. And he starts with starting to bring this power into my life. Building a character that he can trust to do good in the world he loves. So it gives us a new vision for life. And I start to not just look for, not to just find joy in the life God gives me, but I start to look for the good of everybody around me, including God. And I can even start to learn to do that without so much effort because his grace is sustaining me and at work in my life. But we make really strong decisions around it. We have intention in the way we live and we start living with a very serious intentionality, okay? We make decisions of, I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone here. Or, man, I've never been able to, 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 to get past this wall that I hit in my life. But you know what? I sense God's invitation to see what's on the other side of that wall where I'm stuck. The, words, the word stuck, Jim and Ben have used in this series is a very key word. Like a bird in the cage or a prisoner chained to a wall. You hit a wall, all of us hit that wall. All of us, every Christian hits a wall. Some people call it a mid-faith crisis. And you're like, mid, mid, you got it? mid-faith mid crisis, and I, and I begin to see, oh, I feel stuck, and religion seems kind of heavy for me, and I know I'm not enough, and then I feel bad about myself, and I feel guilty, and I just feel stuck, and it's not, ah, uh, and so there, we, we sometimes carry this religious burden and obligation, and it's somehow depressing, but it's very dutiful, and we're trying so hard, and it's just not enough, and I'll never live up, and I don't know what to do. We hit a wall, and so we begin to live with intentionality where we can start to make some new decisions about our life, and we're actually very strong about our commitment. Uh, to change. We make decisions about it. Some of us don't change because we just haven't decided to. So, all right. But then some of us don't change because we don't have a strategy to back that up and live it out. And so we've talked every, every part of the series, we've talked about planning, planning for change. This is what I need to do. And I get my body into it and things start to change. Okay. That's, that's kind of where we're at in, in this series. Um, did, did you like the Napoleon thing earlier? I mean, I'm going to say it again. You, I'm going to say it again. And if you've heard it before, just admire how I tell it. All right? Uh, Napoleon said this, and you're not going to believe what he said. This guy has a, a split personality or something because he doesn't follow it up with action. Because we know Napoleon Bonaparte. This guy is a French war wagon and wreaks destruction everywhere he goes. And he came into my beloved Mexico to steal silver so he could finance his empire while the United States was in the middle of the Civil War. And I don't mean to get in a history lesson, but it's kind of fun. Here's what he says about Jesus. Whether Napoleon's life lined up with it or not, he said this. He said, everything, you won't believe this, everything in Christ astonishes me. His love overawes me and his will confounds me. Between Christ and anyone else in all of human history, there is no possible term of comparison. Whether history or humanity or nature or the ages, nothing compares to Christ or the goodness that we see in his gospel. And I don't, that was awesome. I don't know. So maybe there's only two things Napoleon and I have in common. The high view of Christ and I'm two inches taller than that guy. And I'm from Texas, I'm pretty sure I could take him. <laughs> that would... <laughs> Need some of you guys who are trainers here to... All right. Uh, 
So I'm like Napoleon too, though. I have this high view of Christ and I know he's good and I know he's strong and I know he has what the world needs. But deep down inside too, I like feel, I, I feel like I, there's something hard to believe about all that, that he's actually living in me, right? That actually he makes his home in me. Um, Jesus, as much as anything as he was doing in his, in his life, as much as anything, he is turning religion upside down and saying, I, I know you, you try to have this dutiful performance-based religion, and I know it's really, really heavy on you, but what I want is relationship. I don't care about your religion. He would say things like this, and he changed the world when he said things like this. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not your sacrifice. I desire your heart and your close friendship, not your religious performance based in duty that you could never live up to. I want you, and I want to do it closely with you. I want your mercy. I want your heart in it. And that's how he wants to work from the inside out. He would say things like this. I don't call you servants. And I know some of you guys are such great servants of Christ. He says, I call you friends. There's a priority in, in, in relationship with Jesus. He's like, I call you, first of all, my friend. He would stand in front of a religious temple built by the heroes of Israel, a massive religious system and, 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 and good in so many ways, but also overbearing and heavy on people who were trying to learn how to live life with God. He would stand in front of a temple and it's so Im impressive, right? The center of Israel's religious worship. And Jesus would say, say this, he would say, he'd look at it with his friends and go, someone greater than the temple is right here. And he starts talking about how his body is the temple. And you can destroy it, but God will bring it back in three days. And so somehow in this resurrection life too, he says, your body also is a temple of the living God. And it's really, really hard for me to believe that because I know who I am. Right? Right? And it's hard for you to believe that because you know what you've done. Or you know those thoughts that you think. And I'm saying, can we go back to the essence of what Jesus was doing with his life? Not just forgiving our sins as if that weren't enough. He's like, I want to be your friend. Um, listen to this. He's carrying, like there's this semi-truck burden on people's shoulders. And if you just stop for a second, I don't think you think about your burden. The heavy thing or things you carry. And listen to what he says. He says, come to me. Yeah, everything in Christ astonishes me. Come, come to me. All you that are weary, tired, and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you like oxen use, so you're teamed up with Christ carrying that heavy load. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If Jesus was doing, he did so much with his life. But I think he's doing one thing that is very, very special that we miss a lot of. He looks at religion and how hard it is to change when it's so heavy. And he comes to us closely. And I think he wants to bring back the joy and the lightness we can have in a life with God. He says, I want to do it as your friend. Uh, uh, as it takes me a long time, I'm from Texas. We're pretty stubborn and thick-headed. My poor wife has to live with me. But I really want to be God's friend. And as a matter of fact, I don't think my life is about much more than that. 
I think you're in the world to be loved by God. I think he made you to be his friend, to experience in your life here and now friendship with God. And as my friendship with God deepens and as I listen to other people and how they relate to God, I am convinced that the greatest analogy of the relationship God desires with you is friendship. Jesus says this to his friend. This is on the day before he dies. And you talk about the most, I've heard you talk about the most important things to you if you know your death is coming. He says, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Yes, he will take a bullet for you. And you know there are people in your life you'd take a bullet for too, so you can understand them, right? I lay, my down, I lay down my life for you, for my friends. You are my friends. And there's obedience in that friendship if you do what I command. Obedience is very important, y'all. I don't call you servants any longer. I don't just care about what you do for me. I call you my friends. A servant doesn't know what the master is doing. Jesus shares with us what's going on. Um, Spiritual growth happens through mutual self-revelation. I open my life and heart up to God, and he opens up his heart and life up to me. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Listen to this. You didn't choose me. Let us sink in. I chose you. When Jesus is calling his first disciples, it says that he drew to himself those he wanted to be with him. And they'd go to work together. He wanted to be with them. He wants to be with you. He has chosen you for friendship. I want to say a few things about friendship real quick. Uh, you might take a picture of it. You might just hang on to it. Uh, it may take a, a little while for it to, to settle in to where you actually live. But there's three principles I really want to share as you consider becoming or, or experiencing Christ not just as a, a religious idea. He's more than an idea. He's not an idea. He's a person. He's a friend. But that everything there is, everything there is, it has been given to us for friendship with God. Everything in your life is given to you as an act of friendship with God. So as you enjoy the Colorado Rocky Mountains, they're beautiful, y'all. They're beautiful. Jesus was an alpinist. He would go away to quiet places to pray and he'd, he'd go climb mountains. A lot like a lot of you, right? And he did it as an experience of friendship with God. Uh, you're given the Rocky Mountains for friendship with God. Their beauty, their majesty. Uh, the, maybe, maybe, maybe you like to um, drink a, 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 a warm cup of something in the mornings, Right? It's, it's given to you as, a, as, a, as an act of friendship with God. Uh, maybe you like to make cookies on Friday nights like me and my daughter do. I, we, we always want to make something sweet together on a Friday night and we enjoy just being together. And um, that, that moment is given to me as an act of friendship with God. Um, I'm going to jump to the next idea about friendship. Shared experience is the core of every Friendship. We become better friends the more experiences we have together. And I shared with you just now a few good experiences. Rocky Mountains, cups cups of hot chocolate and and, and, and Friday night cookies, right? But also the things that are most difficult in our lives are, are, my wife always tells me, James, shared experience or uh, shared suffering builds strong community. And you know this, like in the toughest moments of your life and you got those good friends around you, 
and you're in it together, no matter what, it builds even through the hardest things in our life because we share that experience. We, come, we become stronger. Um, I, I get to travel the world with Jim and Ben on trips from time to time and just traveling together and spending two weeks together. It's like shared experience is core to our friendship. You know, it's the same thing with God. So, so in your life, look for those experiences with him. Cultivate them. Do them on purpose. Notice them every time they come around. Turn and notice, all right? Awareness is so important to our life with God. We recognize when he's around, all right? And last thing, what makes for great friendship also makes for great prayer. And I know I'm kind of breaking our idea of prayer kind of out of a box. Like it's not just when I sit down before a meal or, or when I'm about to tuck my kids in bed at night, but that I'm talking about our lives can be like one big prayer. Every time in our normal experiences of everyday life, maybe one, we, we, we turn to, toward God in a second of gratitude and we say, thank you. Like this week at Thanksgiving, and, our, and something kind of simple in our heart turns for a split second. God, you're so good. Thank you. Thank you. Or when things are really, really hard and we pray Psalm 70 verse 1, one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. You might ought to pray it a hundred times a day. Maybe try praying it 20 or 30 times a day. Lord, make haste to help me. Come quickly to my rescue. I, I pray that prayer all the time. Because in Mexico City, I can feel so overwhelmed. And I wake up every morning, and this is what I say. You know the prayer that I pray? Every morning. Lord, I'm incompetent. And that's okay. I know I'm going to be in situations where I'm way in over my head. I'm in over my head standing up here right now. And so I'm like, Lord, and I'm down there with Ben going, Lord, make haste to help me come quickly to my rescue. So where there's a prayer of help, Lord, it's a good prayer, y'all. Or thank you, God. It's a good prayer. Um, what makes for great friendship also makes for great prayer, even in these split-second moments. I love to run. My friend Jorge signed me up for the Mexico City Marathon two months ago. I was mad at him when he did it. He's like, I signed you up. I want you to celebrate my 50th birthday with me and run it with me. I'm like, okay. Well, we love it, to run together. I could do without the marathon. I'll run a half and feel good about it. Uh, but Jorge and I run together because we're friends. We enjoy that time together. We run and talk and check in with each other. We're good friends. We run together. It, man, about 12, 13, 13 years ago, um, I found myself in a really tough place in my life. I was letting my family down and everybody I love, and I'm, uh, I'm a loser. I'm cloaked in failure. I don't know what to do with myself. I can't live up to the expectations I have of myself. Um, I want to make everybody in the world happy, and I can't make anybody happy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm an idiot. Was, was, can anything good come out of West Texas? Pretty, pretty sure not, <laughs> but I started to run because I knew it made for good friendship, and I was like, God, maybe I can just start running with you and sort of start sorting some stuff out that I don't like inside me. I started running every day, and so because what makes for great friendship also makes for great prayer. I think we need to train and learn to do stuff like that with God, whatever you love to do, learning to do it with God. Um, there are a lot of ways in which we have a hard time changing, and I'm sure we have a whole lot of excuses. But I'm going to talk about maybe the biggest hindrance to the spiritual change that we really want for our lives. Okay, I think this is the biggest one. And I'm going to take us back to the Black Plague in England in the 1400s and read to you what... Uh, a lady named Julian of Norwich wrote. She went, her, sh history seems to show that she had lost her family, her husband and children in the Black Plague, okay? Some of you might be living through what feels like a Black Plague, emotionally or spiritually or physical struggle. Um, Three-fourths of Julian's town, her city, was wiped out by it. She goes into a 10-day coma, comes out of it, and starts writing about what life with God might should be like. So she's very helpful when it comes to life with God. She says this, We say, 
that God is all wise and understands everything. I'm with Julian on that. I think God is all wise. He understands everything. And that he's all powerful and can do anything. And I'm with her there too. She says, but we also say that he's all loving and can do anything. He's all love. And there we draw back. Because we don't believe that he could possibly love us. And that is the great hindrance to those God loves. We draw back from his love because we can't believe it's actually possible. And so we keep God's love at an arm's length or stiff arm it like the Heisman Trophy because we don't know what to do with ourselves or what we've made of ourselves. And so when you start talking about God as love, close and tight, and God as friend, uh, it's, I have a hard time remembering that that could be true, and I draw back. Friends, where do we think we're going when we draw back from God? when what he wants is a friendship with you. You have to do something to start believing that. I think it comes through practice and strategy and some determination and some intentionality and a vision of life for God that could be filled with joy and lightness and just confidence and strength and where your character is becoming more and more like Christ because you spend time with him. Because me, I am changed by my friendships. Friendships leave us different. The same thing in human relationships, I'm saying, is true with God. He wants to be your friend. So I'm going to call my friend up here, Jim. Uh, and I just want to kind of talk through what we've uh, been talking about right now. And because um, Jim is just so practical. And if things that I've talked about are way up here, I wonder if we could kind of just ground them in the reality of, of our everyday life. So I know that whenever I teach, or when I hear someone teach, right. I have a lot of thoughts uh, that go on inside me. Um, things stir inside me. Uh, and and I, I wonder just, first question, like as you sat there and listened, is there anything that strikes you or that you want to add to it or what stirs up? Yeah, so, um, so, you know, I sit down there, and I'm nodding my head. I'm looking around, and people are nodding their heads, and I hear a few, mm, you know, you know, church yeah. people, mm, that, right? It's good. I like it. It makes me happy when yeah, I hear it. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, but here's what I think. So I believe everything you said is true, okay, and I agree with it all, and I, and I, can, teach, I can teach what you just said. I, 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 I can teach it for everybody else. Here's the thing. I think most of us, it's true for everybody except me. Yeah. Like, I think God wants to be your friend. Yeah. And I think God can work through her crap. And I think that, that God doesn't even break a sweat to, to do that over yeah. there. But the idea that he actually wants to be with me, um, I don't understand why. Because I know me. And if I thought, I, sometimes I want to stiff arm him because if he gets too close, then I'm going to, here's the, because uh, I have a lot of things going on in here. Uh, the meds, they don't work. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've imagined this conversation over and over and over is that he does, I let him close yeah. and then he sees me and goes, oh, that, never mind. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I think he loves me as long as I produce for him. And at the moment that I stop producing for him or it's a matter of time till I screw up and he's gonna go, thanks for your time, I, I'll find someone else. And I don't, I don't wanna set myself up for that. You know, it's like, if he loves and can do anything, why doesn't he? You know, and sometimes in that, it just, it feels like that's probably true for everybody else, and it's just not going to work for me. I think I speak, do you all want to talk about, you know, and it's like, it's true, it's just, is it true for me? Yeah. And learning that, you know, and since I've met you, you know, four years ago, that's probably one of the things that you've been teaching me the most is, is that he's right here. Yeah. Because it's, it's really easy to keep him in a stained glass window. Yeah. In a church, and yeah. in a song, or something like that. But the idea that he's right here, uh, like, 
you know, the kingdom of God is like as close as the air as you breathe. That's different than when you die, you go to a Disney castle on a cloud. That's, that seems safer and different, but actually that he's right up here and wants to be my friend and walk through life with me. Um, that sounds like too good to be true, but if it was true, man, it'd be good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I want it, so. Yeah, this is eternal life, Jesus said. When, the only time Jesus gives a definition of eternal life, he says this, um, uh, this is eternal life. Right. That they may know you. That's experiential relationship. No, that they may know you. That's friendship. Yeah. And As the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. And it's I, now. I've, I've read that verse all my life and no. it never clicked until eternal life is not after I die. Eternal no. life is friendship with God starting the moment I meet him and then walking through life. Eternity already started. Yeah. And so, and, and even that, I can be patient with myself because I have a long way to go, but we have eternity to fix it. Right. You know? Right. I can be patient. Spiritual formation, like we want to become more like Christ, is the slowest of all movements, they say. Right. And so we see Jesus uh, uh, take like a leper, and in a, in a word, he heals him. It's gone. Yeah. Or a blind person, in a word, he heals him. Or there's these external forces to people, and there's demons, and with a word, he casts it out. But there's not, it's fascinating, there's not one time in Scripture when Jesus, someone comes to say, uh, Jesus, I, I have this anger problem. Or I got this character flaw. Or I live with this lust. Or you know what? My problem is laziness. And that he just heals it in a word. He doesn't do it like that. Right. It's like, you know what he does? He takes, here's what he does. He takes 12 flawed people and they become friends and they spend three years with him and they start growing a character like his. And so Peter goes from coward, I got a fear problem, to Peter the courageous, one of the most courageous men the world has ever seen because he spent time with Jesus. But it took a long time. Peter's falling all the time. And he's like, like, you, like you always say, Lord, get away from me. That's what Peter does in a boat. Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful person. And we draw back right. to where really Jesus was, goes, hey, let's, let's form, let's form this, this friendship here. And, and I'll change you little by little. But I'm afraid to let him come close because Jesus. he said it when they met. Jesus, I, I cannot do this. Don't waste your time yeah. on me. And then three years later when he denies Christ three times and oh. the rooster crows, you have to think he was like, I told him back in the boat. He didn't listen. Right? I, I, I don't change, yeah. all right? I, we just wasted three years because I don't. <laughs> Or think, you should have chose someone else. Absolutely. I'm, it's a matter of time. Till I think God's going to go, I, you're right. I think I should have. And, and then I'm going to go, well, see? There we go, you know, and yeah. this, but this idea, you know, of, of, I love what you said a minute ago, because you, you blow up, we all, a lot of us grew up in church, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, some, some franchise, I don't know what it is, but anyway, <laughs> but we, we all say we believe in God, and there's Jesus in the equation, all that, you know, but, but prayer has always been an event where it starts with your Heavenly Father and ends with amen, mm -hmm. and then you go on, yeah. and this whole idea of, uh, you no, know, prayer is like all day long, and you said something that uh, you've told me before, is like just to stop, you know. I remember sitting on a bench with you down in Mexico back yeah. in March, and I was like in a dark place. I go, I go dark a lot, and then, uh, and then you, we you said, all do, we all do. But you said to me, you said, "Whoa, whoa, stop! What would what would Jesus say to you right now?" I'm like, oh, shoot! And, uh, I said, "Here, I know what he'd do. He'd reach his hand, he'd reach his finger under my chin, like I would do my my little boy. He'd be the lifter of my head. He'd look me in the face, and then, and I couldn't finish it. I just took a walk with Jesus." Which sounds so crazy, except I, I do that a lot now. You, you taught yeah. me, like, just turn your yeah. heart toward, toward your hands. Like, hey, the idea he's right here. Yeah. I've always thought he's somewhere else. Like, like, you're my friend, one of my dearest friends, you know? And, and I, I can close my eyes, I can go, there he is, yeah. all right? I, I, I'm at that point right now, I'm trying to learn to do that with Jesus. Yeah. I'm convinced sometimes if I close my eyes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run into his, his chest, just like I just did with you. And that, yeah. I, but that takes practice. Yes, it does. And you've taught, you've taught me that. This is, a, this is a discipline, and it's different than anything I ever was taught in church, that he's right here, mm -hmm. you know? So I have two, two chairs on my patio. Yeah. And I sit in my, I sit in my, it's so crazy. I love My this. neighbors I are like, this. Uh, he's doing it again. Uh, <laughs> I do it. I sit on my back patio, and I talk to an empty chair and out loud, all right? Usually I have a pipe, but it's no smoke November, but whatever, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> 
and it's half over, all right, because Christmas is coming, all right. So I sit on it, and I'm like, so Jesus, what about this? This past summer, I, I talked about, I was like, I, I, was on, I sat on a rock, and I had a conversation with Jesus, and said, tell me something, Lord, respectfully, tell, tell me something new, and he wouldn't, he stared me down. I know he wasn't there, but I, he was, he was yeah. there, yeah. And, he, and he was like, he stared at me like, I'm going to sit here with you, Jim, until you remember what I've already said is true about you. And I went, oh, got it, you know, and that's, that, that's new, mm -hmm. You know, you're the only person, you know, Scott tried, but you're the only one who got me to read a book. And it's right. because um, <laughs> it was an itty bitty tiny little book, you know, and, and, uh, and I remember it was, it was uh, practicing God, God's presence in my life. And I read it and then I, I sat in a van in South Sudan and I pictured Jesus sitting on a van site, yeah. seat behind me, like bumping along, like, bumpy Lord, you can fix this, smooth it, you know, and uh, he didn't, he didn't that time either. But, um, but now, now every day I just, I'm trying to turn towards him. You know, and like a friend. Yep. If, he could, if, he, if it's true that he wants to be our friend, it changes everything. It does. It changes us. It changes everything. Yeah. One, one of the things that you said last night, and then, um, and then Aaron told you to put it back in, and then you forgot, and then you, did, you forgot again. And, yeah, uh, I did. I did. I, one of the things I think. It's I, crazy up here. I can't hold a thought in my head. I, this looks nuts. I know. You know, it's like. And there's like 2,000 people watching in cam on campuses. And 100,000 people. We're from West online. Texas. Who, who, all right. This is nuts. We're, un we're out of our lane. I'm in T-ball. <laughs> so here's the thing. We're just, this is the last service. We're just going to like <laughs> knock it out. And then we're going to the mountains. Uh, uh, I think that Jesus would want to be my friend. Yeah. But not like this. Like I, I got to fix some stuff and change some stuff. And this whole idea that you don't have to be a different person than you already are for Jesus to like you, mm -hmm. that's a game changer. You do not have to change who you are to become a friend of Christ. And our best friends are like that too. That's true. They love us right where we are. Um, I think the awareness is very, very important that he's right here. And if, and if you've been hanging out with Flatterns for very long, one of the great things that this place teaches is that um, experience of life, God happens now, right where I am, in the air I breathe, in the heart that beats inside my chest, right, right this close, right? Yeah. T uh, tell the cook story. All right. All right. So um, 16th century, uh, uh, nobody, no name, cook in a monastery. Uh, Did you read he, this in a book? I read this in a book. It's called The Practice of Presence. So he... I should read. <laughs> I'm not going to read. <laughs> Just tell me what to say. He's a, he's, he is a nobody. He is a nobody. You know, and, and uh, he's not even the kitchen chief. He's like the kitchen aide. And I feel like that a lot too, right? I mean, we all do. I'm a kitchen aide. And, but when he died, his brothers went through all of his stuff, looking for loose change, <laughs> like Billy Crystal said. I get it. And they found 16 letters that he called conversations. And they read it, and it was so good. And it was a teaching about how he had learned to find God in everyday stuff. He called it in the, in the mundane and routine ho-hum of normal life. And he would, say, he would say, I can scrape eggs off of a pan for love and friendship with God. He said, I could pick up a straw off the ground or sweep the floor in friendship with God, like with an awareness that he and God are doing that action together. And he goes, when it dawns on me, if nobody else asks me to do something else, I, I finish that and I just turn to God and say, um, I, I am happier than a king to get to live my life with you. And it's in the ho-hum routine, normal everyday stuff, you know? And then when life happens, because you've spent every day together. So, so some of you remember this. A, a year ago this week, next weekend. So was, I came up here the weekend after Thanksgiving. And some of you remember this. I just confess, I'm not doing well. Um, my body was uh, falling apart, and eventually I, that led to this. Uh, mentally and spiritually, relationally, 
Um, it was just falling apart. I was just, I, I was going dark. I had the worst day of, on staff I've ever had. 11, after 11 years, I sat in my office, had a meeting, and it was just, I just got angrier and angrier. And finally, I just yelled at everybody and kicked them out of my office, and I stared at a wall for five hours, right? And then I just got in my truck, and, and I went home, and now I'm in my kitchen. I'm vomiting all this emotion. And Robin goes, hey, 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 Jim, Jim, call James. And that made sense. Here's what would not have made sense. Hey, do you remember three, three and a half years ago, you went on a mission trip and you met that guy in Mexico, James something, and you said he was smart and seemed real spiritual, but you haven't talked to him in three years. Call him in your moment of need. It would have been ridiculous. But I think that's what we do with God, yeah. right? He's like, I haven't talked to God in forever, and then you get cancer, and then you get a car wreck, and then you get this, and you get right. that. And also you turn towards God, and you're like, where are you? And, and we think he left us, and, and it's like, sometimes I feel like every... The only time I talk to God is in crisis, and then I have to reintroduce myself. Yeah. Um, I know it's been a while, um, but <laughs> let me tell you what's going on in my life. And the idea, you know, I, I, I called you because, I mean, uh, uh, several times a week we're talking either on the phone or FaceTime or, or email or text messaging, or we're getting on a plane and we're going, let's go serve together, or I'm coming yeah. down to your house and you're coming to my house, whatever that is, and it's shared life. And that's what right. we're talking about. Yep. Is that when we have this thing in common, we have some, you know, some that familiarity. Yeah, that's some awesome. road, you know, under our tires together, riding together. Now it's like friendship, and that's the same thing with God. Yes. Now here we're going to communion together, all right? But here's what happens, and I love communion because communion and community, yeah. community is doing life together, and that's friendship. So somehow, what we're about to do with bread and and, and juice, and what you've been talking about, they're connected somehow. But here, I've I've sat in rooms like this all my life. You know, and I've heard, I, I look at people up here on, on the stage, you know, missionaries and pastors and go, they're different. They're different than me. Yeah. And, and we're not. And so this, this living life with God in the, in the everyday. And so let me just paint you a couple pictures. Tell me what that looks like. Because like, like so my daughter and my daughter-in-law both, both have babies on the way and have preschoolers at home, right? Allie's not here today because she's on like day four or five of just being sick, you know? And, and she'll, she'll post things or she'll send a Robin a, a text message going, Mom, I'm just tired. Yeah. Because it's goldfish and poop. And oh. then the goldfish turns into poop. And then poop gets smeared on the goldfish. It's, it's just nuts, it's a cycle. you know? It's a cycle. It's a cycle. And then she has to go wash up stuff that they're just going to get dirty. They're needy little people, you know? Oh. And, I, and the and tantrums. And the tantrums. She's just tired, right? And she doesn't feel good. It's like, it's like so where, what does it look like for a young mom yeah. in, the, in the mundane? Because I, I think every, we, we block it about how horrible it's wonderful, but it's horrible. Yeah. It's hard, right? So the young mom out there, what does turn your heart towards God look like in that for her? Help, Lord, come quickly to my rescue. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that, you know, I've been talking a lot, like positively, like the good experiences that we're sharing them with God, but I also think the hard things too. And like, I think that the hard things that are part of our life, that are they're part of our life, they're our reality that we have got to train ourselves in awareness, maybe even just comes by saying it a lot, but it's not just Allie and the goldfish. It's Allie and the goldfish and God. It's, it's Leah and the tantrum and God, or it's me, and I don't wanna wash those dishes, I'm so sick of it. It's me and the dishes and God or it's me and that hard conversation and God. It's never just me and the hard conversation. That's too much. It is never, it is never just me and the burned food. It's never just me and-, the poop and all over the place. It's, yeah. <laughs> right? All the moms out are going, yes, that's Tuesday. Yeah, I get it. It's never just me and the divorce. It's me and God in the divorce. You hear that? I'm going to give you two. So, because there's a mom or dad listening to us right now. And you know what? They've barely been able to pay attention because they don't know where their kid is. Yeah. They don't know if their kid's alive, addicted, you know, in a gutter, in, 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 you know, in the wrong bed, whatever that is. What, what does that look like? God is like those parents. And when that lost son went away, he waits on his porch and, and, and waits and looks for that lost child. 
and it's killing him on that porch and he doesn't know what to do. But if he sees him from a long way off, God's father heart goes running towards him and he throws all dignity out the window and he's on his way running. God knows what it's like to lose a son. God knows what it's like to lose a lot. And he's with us in that loss when we feel it and it hurts so bad. It's, it's, it's me and the loss in God. Shared experience. Shared experience. It's the core of our friendship. So my friend Carlene has cancer. And it's not good. She had surgery this week. And, and I'm going to go see John and Carlene later, right? What, what do I say? I, I always, I, I learned this from a friend. Um, God always, 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 Jesus always comes to me with his arms around my friends. And so when you go visit John and Carlene, it's Jim and Jesus going to visit John and Carlene. And I think that Jesus, Carlene's burden must be so heavy and John's with her and yours with her. I think it's really important to remember that Jesus carried a heavy burden that he couldn't carry on his own. Hmm. He carried a cross, and if you remember, he, 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 he was fallen, and he, yeah. he couldn't pick it back up. And so Jesus himself, God himself, needed to grab Simon of Cyrene out of the crowd. And he has a couple of boys there with him, and they pull him out of the crowd. He's from Africa, and he gets alongside Jesus and helps Jesus carry his cross. And I think Jesus is willing to come alongside our heaviest burdens and pick it up with us too. Carlene, cancer, and Jesus. His Car- cancer will crush you. Carrying it together. So I think one of the things you said is I get so far and I can't get any further. Mm-hmm. All right? Because fear, even if God has promises for us, we're about to take bread and juice. And if you don't want to do this, that's fine. And if, you, if we're going to pass bread and juice, it's something Jesus gave us to remember who he yeah. is to us. All right? So everything you've been talking about and then all the, you know, the, the responses that are coming up is going, I bet that's not true for me. Bring that together with what we're about to do in communion. Yeah. And then, and then pray us into communion uh, as we remember our friend, Jesus. Remember that gesture of friendship you talked about where, where, where you sense God, you feel so shameful and he picks up your chin? Yeah. It's a gesture of friendship. He does that because you are friends. That's what a friend would do. Yeah. When he says, so here's this bread and here's this, this fruit of the vine. It's, it's, he gives it in a gesture of friendship that God loves us so much, he sends the best he's got and he sends it to be right here in the middle of us. And so we call it communion. It, we are together on all of this. And he doesn't want us to forget it. Hey. Oh, it's too easy to forget. I know. I forget every day. So this is a gift. Don't forget. That's right. That I'm your friend. That's right. Hey, so, so you have to close with this. And then we're at the communion. And we're over, but it's 11 o'clock. And the Broncos are pay for, play for a while, and they're no good. So it's our... Um, <laughs> I'm still cheering for them. But it's, uh, Come on. But shared suffering. Shared suffering. Builds community. <laughs> oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, hey, uh, so t- talk about this and then pray us into communion. And, uh, yeah, so just talking about that arm's length we keep from God, keep God at whenever he really wants to get in close and tight with love for each of us. That, with that, he wants to be our friend. I was listening to the Global Partners on um, just a couple days ago and... I was struck by the love, the Christ-like love of these mothers, you know, and, and every one of them, they're like, uh, they, they do this good work in the world, but they also carry this heavy burden of wanting to be the, the best of mothers, you know, and they love their kids, and they would do anything for their kids, and I, when I heard one of the mothers speak, I just say, hey, can I read this, because it just reminds me of the, the way that, that, that you and your husband are living with your family, Right? Just love, listen to this. 
if you took all the love of all the best mothers and fathers who have lived in the course of human history, all of them, all their goodness, all their kindness, all their patience, and all their fidelity, they're not going anywhere. Never giving up on us, right? All their wisdom and all their tenderness, all their strength and love, and united all of those qualities in a single person. That person's love would only be a faint shadow of the furious love and mercy in the heart of God the Father addressed to you and me at this moment. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Oh, I love this place. I love these people, and you uh, love them so much too. Lord, would you bless Flatirons, um, bless our friends across the world, uh, bless us with shared experience with you, and that hearts turn towards friendship where we let you in up real close. And that, Lord, we believe has the power to change everything. Yes, Lord, your love heals everything. And so as we come into the communion time, we just want to give you thanks for the body and blood of Christ and the sacrifice he's willing to make to be with us in friendship. Uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. May you bless each friend here as through friendship and as your coworkers, you work together to turn every life into a celebration. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us. If you want prayer, you can go to flatironschurch.com slash pray, and we'll be praying for you throughout the week. If you want to be part of what God's doing here at Flatirons, you can go to flatironschurch.com slash give online. And if you'd like to tell us what God's been doing in your life, email mystory at flatironschurch.com, and we'd love to hear your story.